So we're setting up the live stream right now and um, we'll get that going before we hit the record button. It always has this weird delay. <laughs> <laughs> hey everybody, what's going on? We are live right now, about to hit the record button for Seller Roundtable. Um, and I'm here with my friend, Andrew Mack, and we're gonna be talking about marketing today. We're gonna be talking about how to drive traffic to your brand off of Amazon, since that's something that all of us realize we need to do. So, uh, you know, I'm excited to get nerdy with Andrew about this today and I'm um, gonna hit the record button. If you guys wanna join us in the Zoom, you can go to sellerroundtable.com forward slash live and we'll see you here. But until then, let's go ahead and hit the record button and get this thing going. Hey everyone, what's up? Welcome to the Seller Roundtable. I'm Amy Weiss and my co-host Andy Arnott is out today. He is on a plane going somewhere. I think he said the Midwest. And I'm here with the amazing Andrew Mapp and we are going to talk about marketing today and all the wonderful things Andrew does in the e-commerce industry to have to do with marketing and external traffic of driving some, some awesome traffic to your brand off of Amazon because we can all use some more of that. So welcome to the show, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Well, why don't you start by just giving us a little bit or as much as you want or as little as you want about you and you know your background, where you're from, all that fun stuff. Sure. All right. So let's see. Uh, I started in e-commerce marketing about 15 years ago. So my dad actually owned uh, a company that was one of the first companies that was actually invited to start selling something other than books on Amazon. They turned it down and I love picking on them for it to this day. Uh, but I've pretty much been in e-commerce marketing since then. Um, I've been in-house at a few places, uh, but I've been primarily on the agency side of things uh, in 2016. I started an agency with someone in late 2019. We ended up exiting that. And then in early 2020, I started Blue Tusker, which is what I'm doing now. Uh, and so we are a full service digital marketing company for e-commerce sellers. We work primarily with sellers that are looking to diversify, uh, whether it's away from Amazon or to Amazon or away from Walmart or to Walmart or eBay or Wayfair or really anywhere that they want to be. Um, I'm currently outside uh, Philadelphia. I'm originally from South Florida and I don't know. I feel like that's, that's the gist of it. <laughs> so what got you interested in marketing in the first place? So you mentioned um, selling books, uh, that kind of thing, but what got you interested in marketing and traffic? Like what got you excited about that? I was always really interested in like just traditional advertising, even as a kid. Like I remember the earliest memory I have, I think I was like 11 or 12 and I was at a restaurant and I picked up a Heinz ketchup bottle and on the back of it, they had like this contest of like submit a commercial and they might use it. And I, I ended up not doing it, but I ended up like sitting there at the table and just rattling off ideas, knowing like, all right, yeah, but their audience wouldn't like this and they probably wouldn't let me do this with it. And so I just sat there and I just kind of realized like, I'm pretty decent at this. And so it was one of those things like, you know, kind of leaned that way in college and all that fun stuff. Um, but then uh, in between when I had first started in marketing, which was at e-commerce with my father, as I mentioned, um, I was actually in a band for years and we used to travel uh, all over the country and I had to figure out how to promote ourselves in the beginning and then it got to a point where other bands started to ask me to help them. Then venues started to ask me to help them with anyone that came their way. And I actually ended up starting my first agency was more on the music promotion and advertising side for tours and artists that pivoted into uh, uh, basically like hospitality, which kind of got me a little bit into retail. And then obviously, as we got further into, you know, as time went on, I started, I ended up getting back into e-commerce and I've been there ever since. Wow. So you, a lot of the marketers that we talked to, especially in e-commerce industry started as sellers themselves. And then they just got really excited about marketing. Mm -hmm. So you have been excited about marketing since you were a kid and you started marketing for people kind of followed that passion and then weaved in and out of various industries 
and ended up in e-commerce. So you don't have, do you have experience as a seller? Have you sold your own wares before or have you just followed the marketing path? My own personally, I guess technically I have, I mean, we had merch and stuff as a band, but that was about it. But my own personally, I never owned my own myself, but I have been uh, in-house more or less as a partner in a couple of different places. Um, but yeah, I, to me, the reason I've always really liked the e-commerce approach is honestly, is because I got so tired of being reliant on a sales team. I, you know, most marketers, if they're strictly marketing, they go B2B because lead generations is a little bit easier, but I got so tired of sales teams not being able to close anything. So I was like, I'm going to e-commerce where I can, where a I've started and then B where I can actually like make sure that the deal closes so I can see the whole path through and then even how to keep people coming back and buying. So e-commerce has definitely pretty much been where I've been for, I started 15 years ago and I think I got back into it and I've been in it for, I think eight or nine now. Amazing. And how did you first hear about or get into the Amazon side of e-commerce? Ooh. Um, well, when I originally, uh, 15 years ago, when I started with my dad, his business was the first one that was offered to one of the first ones that was offered to sell something other than books on Amazon. And so I got to kind of dig into like what that was going to look like. Um, I was young. I was still in, I think I was, if I wasn't in high school, I was early college. It was a long time ago. Um, and so that kind of got me interested in like, okay, this is interesting. Like what it's going to be like selling products online. Uh, but then fast forward, probably about five or six years, I ended up in house somewhere for a while, uh, at a, uh, company that was pretty far into eight figures selling, uh, 80% of our revenue was on Amazon. So I had to learn Amazon solely. I was really good at off Amazon stuff and was kind of helping us diversify a little bit, but I had to, because that was obviously our, our breadwinner. I had to make sure that I focused on it. And that was where I really started to learn a lot about it. That was about like seven years ago. Um, and then you, now you, you kind of don't have a choice. So. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. It's, I mean, 50% of the major e-commerce platform traffic belongs to Amazon. So it's, it's a big player. Walmart is trying really hard to catch up. Um, but you know, my Walmart sales are any indication, <laughs> like they've got a little ways to go. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about branding and, you know, when you're starting an e-commerce brand, what do you think are some of the fundamentals that folks should be thinking about in order to set themselves up for success, especially when it comes to later than marketing their brand or even pre-marketing their brand and building that list beforehand? What do you think some of those fundamentals are that you've seen are uh, really successful building blocks to building a brand? One of the biggest mistakes I see that most sellers end up not doing, especially when they first launch, is if, if their end goal is to you know, sell the business or something along those lines, then they really need to hone in on the brand aesthetic. So like whether that's the brand voice, the way the brand looks, um, like they need to know not only the product that they're selling, obviously, but also the customer that they're trying to target and then what they need to sound like and look like to entice that customer to shop. There's been countless sellers I've worked with and it, it's, I swear, there's always a handful every year where they've been around for a year and then realize like, oh, we didn't really do any market research before this. And now we need to adjust our brand. We need a new brand name. We need a new uh, we need to change our colors. We need to change our voice. We need to start targeting this person. And they start pivoting all the time and never sit anywhere to really decide like, okay, how do we make this work kind of thing? So without, there's just not enough preparation in the beginning is what I tend to see is, is the biggest problem with getting started. Yeah, I would agree. Um, you know, as a consultant, I work with a lot of people that either come through my program and find a product and we focus on the customer first and then we sell to that customer. And mm -hmm. a lot of the other programs are focused on product first. Find a product that's selling really well and then you know make your differentiations based on bad reviews or whatever your thing is, right? And 
that person goes to market and they have no idea the mind of the customer that they're selling to when that customer makes a buying decision. Mm -hmm. And so today, you know, I was on a call on a coaching call and, um, and you know, this person was thinking about launching a product and I said, Hey, you know, this is actually not a good idea because it's a saturated market. And this person had differentiated in a way that really wasn't going to matter to that customer who's looking for this particular thing, right? It was mm-hmm. a saturated keyword. And, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with competitive, competitive saturated keywords. If you can get to page one with your differentiation and you can keep converting, and then all of a sudden people are looking for your differentiation, But if nobody's looking for what's different about your product um, and you can't get a good medium to long tail keyword in there, you really get stuck. And the other thing I've seen people do, you know, is they just get really wrapped into this product, but they know nothing about the customer. And, you know, they aren't using that language or they're not taking them through a story that helps that customer understand that key question, which is, is this for me? Right. If, if you don't answer that question, then, you know, the customer is just going to move on to your competitors with more reviews, better pricing, whatever it is. Right. Even if they have a worse listing than you. So yeah. I love that. I think it's so, so important. And, and speaking of that, what would you say is the best process somebody can go through to get to know that customer, to figure out who that customer is that they're selling to? Uh, market research for the most part is, is usually the easiest way to do it. And honestly, when you say market research, I don't mean like go hire a, you know, a company to do a whole, like sit down and walk. Like you don't have to go through those steps anymore. It's 2022. You can throw some stuff online and figure it out. Um, you know, there's, there's a couple different approaches, but there, you can figure out the general market you want to go after and then develop just some content around it and start to build a community and then literally just ask them. I know people that started Facebook groups before they started launching products and they just asked them, what do you guys want? And they made it. Um, But you can also, you know, think about the product that you're selling. What is your differentiator? And then who is that actually going to resonate with? Because sometimes when, when someone goes like, oh, you know, I'm going to launch this and this is why my product's going to be different. I, I'm a pessimist. So I always sit down and I go like, well, why didn't that competitor make it this way? Like there might be a reason here. And so if you're going to differentiate, you want to know like, okay, well then who am I going to target? And then find those people and talk to them and make sure that in fact, that is the case because, you know, there are those diamonds in the rough where like every, like how many people have like cooler and like, uh, like, um, like water bottle businesses now, like everyone and their mother has started one. And it's like, I would never have guessed that some of those were able to differentiate as much as they were. But to your point, as you mentioned before, launching something like that strictly on Amazon is a nightmare because standing out from everyone is incredibly hard. There's so many times I'll talk to a seller and they'll be like, oh, I, you know, I created this product and, and, you know, this and this and this, I'm like, okay. I'm like, well, what makes you different? And they're like, we have better ingredients or we're higher quality or we're more durable. And I go, okay. And I go, all right. I mean, we'll put that stuff in the images. I go, but you're more expensive and people have to take the risk now. And there's just not enough uh, social proof opportunity that you can kind of force on Amazon. And so that's you know, why like I'm thinking about like a water bottle, for example, we use this example on the show all the time. I think it's because it's what's closest to us It's sitting around. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you know, when you think about a water bottle, like you said, the, the better material, like nobody's searching for a water bottle with quality stainless steel. Like that's expected. It's expected that your product is quality. So what else do you have to bring to the table? Like, yeah, but ours is better quality. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what? Like it's expected that your product is good quality period, you know? And just because you have good quality doesn't always mean the customer is going to be willing to pay more for Mm -hmm. better quality when there's another water bottle with 20,000 five-star reviews right next to you that seemingly looks the same and people seem to love it, right? It's so hard to convince them. So I love that. I think it's so important. I, I love how you mentioned like, you don't need to hire a big market research firm, just 
get out there, look on Pinterest, look in Facebook groups, look in, you know, the conversations people are having. I love to look up blogs. I like to read, you know, what are, what things are trending in copywriting, what things are trending in blogs, what questions are people asking? Google makes it easy for you. They say people also ask. And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, that's what people are wondering about. That's their pain points and their pain points lead to decisions. So I love that. That's really, really great advice as far as foundation. So let's talk about once we got our product going and it's selling well, and you know we, we're starting to really grow our brand. We might have a, a few different products in our line, and you know we're making a name for ourselves. What now? What <laughs> is fundamentally important now in terms of moving the needle for us? All right. So here's here's my thought process behind this. And every time I have this conversation, I always get people that are like, I'm never doing that. Why would you do that? And then recently Amazon released something and I go, ha, see, I was right. So <laughs> I set this up real well. So basically I always see a lot of sellers and the way that I would do this as well, which is you launch your product, spend the time and the money on making the listing look great. Because if you land there and you're pitching, like we're high quality and better ingredients and all this stuff, like you better have a really cool video. You better have some great images because that's the only way you're going to stand out. Right. So your market research is kind of on Amazon because while it's expensive, it's not as expensive as launching a product and launching a website and starting to advertise off Amazon. So I see Amazon as a great area to also do your own market research and how viable the product actually is. So let's say you launch a product or a hand or a product line. You have all your products on Amazon. You start to get some traction. It's like, okay, I'm starting to get some sales. Things are looking good. The next thing I suggest is obviously get your brand registered and make sure you build out a storefront. Start driving traffic with sponsored brand ads over to the storefront and, and put up uh, on, your, on the storefront the actual ability to purchase directly from the storefront, right? see how many people you can get to purchase through the sponsored brand ads. So now you've kind of proven out that your storefront can convert. This is where you go, okay, now we start this test. Start with, depending on your product, Facebook ads, TikTok ads, Google, it's going to be dependent on your audience. So it's back to know who you're targeting, then drive the traffic to your storefront and see if the storefront is still converting. The best way to look at this, which is how I always suggest, is you can use the custom source URL and all that fun stuff to you know, check it directly. But with Facebook or Google, you, there's no connection, so you can't actually check conversions. So what I always say is like, just look at how much you're spending in Amazon ads and let's say Google ads combined. And then whatever that percentage increase you just had is make sure that your revenue goes up by that same percentage. And then you'll be that much more comfortable. Like, okay, this is working, right? So now we're starting to drive off Amazon traffic to the storefront. We've proven that the storefront works and that we can drive off Amazon traffic. Obviously, you're going to want to develop, like save, save up, start to hold on to your profit, build some capital, then develop your own website. Start to, and put the money into your website. Don't go cheap on a website because cheap is expensive. It, it, it will cost you so much more money if you have a garbage, like themed, templated site that just doesn't work. But I'm sorry, I get really into this. So like, all right. So you drive all the traffic to the site. So now on your website, underneath your buy now button, you add an available on Amazon button or available on Walmart or eBay or Wayfair or whatever, and let them go directly to your listing. You want to have your pop-ups and all of your extra, extra bells and whistles on your website that you can have for them to convert on the site, because obviously you want to keep the customer data, your margins are probably better and you know you can retarget them and all that fun stuff. But you've proven that your reviews and everything on your Amazon store or on Walmart or wherever you are, are, are working. So let the consumer who's not familiar with your site and not familiar with your brand yet be most comfortable wherever they want to be. So they're most comfortable shopping on Amazon. They know they can get in two days, let them go. You're just building that relationship. You can still retarget them. You can put a conversion tracking code in all of those buttons and retarget anyone who went to your Amazon store. And you could actually just send them back to Amazon with ads, or you can pixel them and retarget them to benefit, give them some kind of other opportunity to shop on the site, right? So now you can see, okay, you've tracked those clicks on those buttons. And if I'm losing you at any point, let me know. So you're tracking those clicks on those buttons, right? <clears throat> you can see like, all right, I got 10,000 clicks on my Amazon buttons over to my webs, over to Amazon, my uh, listings average a conversion rate of 20%. That's X amount of, pro that's X amount of orders, right? So now we can get an assumption that I've driven that many 
orders to Amazon. You can also do the affiliate codes and literally count it if you want to do it that way. But then now you start testing. You go, okay, I'm guessing I got X amount of sales on Amazon, or I know for a fact because I went through the affiliate program. And now I want to see how well I can get this site to work. Just hide the button for a little while. See how it goes with just the buy now button. Keep driving your traffic and see if you can get your own website traffic or your own website revenue to increase from there. And now you've started to develop your own brand. If it doesn't work, just put the button back and you'll be fine for a little while. Do some more testing, figure out what else you got to do. And now you can go back to the brand. So you're kind of easing yourself into basically having your own website because one of the issues that a lot of people don't realize is when they first start a website, they don't have the option for people to shop where they might have already known you. And you're wildly biased on your own website. Everyone assumes that you can control your reviews, which you can. You made your own website. So of course you're going to say it's the best. It's the most durable. It's the best ingredients, blah, blah, blah. It's incredibly biased. So by allowing them to go check out your other reviews or go somewhere else besides a place that you control can actually improve your brand because they get much, a lot more trust behind it. Plus you can loop in like influencer marketing, all that fun stuff. So you're not as biased when you're saying I'm the best. My favorite analogy is always if you're at a party and I were to walk up to you and be like, I'm awesome. You and I should talk. And you would be like, no, you're kind of weird. And then you would go away. <laughs> but if like 15 people came up to you and said, Hey, Andrew's super awesome. You should talk to him. Eventually like, I got to talk to this Andrew guy. I got to know why he's so awesome. That's because a lot of other people were telling you that I'm cool. But if I tell you I'm cool, it's not cool. So it's the same concept of basically easing yourself out of Amazon onto something else and testing it, but then letting the existing social proof do the work. I love it. So let me just see if I understand, if I can like break this down the Amy way of what you just said. <laughs> so you're saying when I have a brand, I have a couple of things going on on Amazon, I'm getting some sales going, I'm looking good. I should make sure that my storefront is legit. And then I do some, maybe some headline search ads or some brand ads leading to my storefront on Amazon. Yep. I start there and I make sure that my storefront from those ads is converting. Yep. If it's not converting, I need to make those adjustments, keep going, keep split testing because it's in Amazon's playground and it's easy. I know Amazon, I'm good to go, right? Then once I get that going, now I know, man, Amazon customers are converting. Well, guess where 50% of customers come from that don't go to amazon.com off of Amazon. <laughs> a lot of people just assume all the customers go to Amazon. No, only 51% of people go direct to Amazon to buy. The other 49% come from off of Amazon on sites like TikTok, Facebook. Actually, 60% of them come from search, which most of that is owned by Google. But either way, what you're telling me to do next is now that I know that my storefront's gonna convert and I have a nice little URL that I can drive people to, I can now use ads because people love Amazon. So depending on my customer, I pick my social media platform that my customer is most likely to be on. And I start running some advertisements to my Amazon storefront. And I see if those things are converting and now I get some more data, I keep it going. I've got on Amazon traffic, I've got off Amazon traffic. My storefront's converting. I'm like, man, my brand is looking good, right? So then what I do is then I can actually start working on my website, making sure it's awesome. But what you recommend on the website is either through Amazon's affiliate program where I can have my own little button there. Um, I'm going to offer them the option to buy it on Amazon from my website. But what's wonderful about that is I've already proved that on Amazon I'm converting. And I'm giving them the option to, you know, know who, who I am on Amazon on a site where they know and trust, right? So I'm doing both of that, but I'm pixeling the data so that I'm capturing the, you know, the customer and who they are, and I can retarget them off of Amazon mm -hmm. and keep visiting them because it does take at least, I think, 12 touches <laughs> nowadays in this digital world Depending, to yeah. sell a product, right? Or to have a customer make a buying decision. So I'm running my traffic, I'm pixeling my data. If everything's going good, then I can try to take that buy it on Amazon button off of my website and then can try to start kind of converting on my website and playing more with that. But until then, 
And if I, if I, it doesn't work, I can just put the buy it on Amazon button back because it doesn't hurt anything and I'm still getting that pixel data. But until then, that is a really great way for people to get their feet wet without having to worry about building this huge website from the start and um, figuring it all out. Did I nail it? Yeah. Yes. Thank yeah. you for teaching me that. And a little bit, a little bit of a, a little bit of proof behind it. So this is what I was talking about before was, I, I can't remember when this came out. It's about only about a month ago, I think that Amazon released that they're beta testing the buy with prime button. So Amazon made their own button. I used to make these bringing things like Photoshop and like clean it up and we like upload them and we got to add all the cookies and all that stuff or all the tracking. And I so have Amazon, like a little button on mine that has a little shopping cart and says, buy it on Amazon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So what they created is a JavaScript code now that you can take and bet on your own D2C site and it just links to whatever uh, product you're taking from it. Right now they're beta testing it and you can actually go and request to get alerted once it's available. But Amazon knows that they're linking over to it. And in fact, um, I actually just did a podcast like two hours before this with uh, uh, Ben, for, uh, the CEO of um, Privy. And he was telling me that they actually talked about that button on the last uh, Shopify quarterly uh, review, uh, revenue investment, all that quarterly, what's the word? The quarterly call for their stocks and all that stuff with all their partners, and everything. I've been drawing blank the on financial that. Financial thing in your jig. That yeah, that guy. <laughs> So they talked about it and they were like, oh, you know, we're all excited about it and all that stuff. And I actually think that it can help because it's going to allow Amazon sellers to ease into going to their own website. And then there are companies out there where you're not going to be able to take that button off your site because people would rather just go to Amazon. There are certain products that some people sell that if you can't get it in two days, they may not want it. And yeah. to be able to do that is really hard until you get to a certain size and then you have three PLs all over the country and that's a different story. But there are some customer, uh, some clients where that's the case and they have to pull it back. But otherwise, I think it's a great way to, to be able to ease into it where you're essentially bootstrapping it. So if you're loaded with capital and you got some investment and you want to go make some cool site and go boss the wall right away, have at it. But I think that's a great way to kind of just take baby steps into it. I love it. I think it's very, very smart and it makes a lot of sense. Um, and one word of warning for new brands, um, you know, you may, if you only have one product and it's your first product, you might want to work on ranking that product and getting some, uh, you know, just doing uh, sponsored product ads because those are the ones that actually rank you before you start doing sponsored brand ads. Uh, because it's it's harder to convert a storefront with just one product if that product is not like something extra special that you know people can't get anywhere else. So, um, but yeah, once you get it going and you got a couple of products, maybe a couple of variations of you know your existing product, uh, that's a really great you know I want to call it a a funnel, right? Because it kind of mm -hmm. kind of is a funnel in its own. Um, it's, it's almost like a sales funnel, right? Um, but it's, it's a great way to start on Amazon, you know, get that interest, hone it down, and then start building another funnel on your website um, that you can actually get that data. So yeah. love it, love it, love it. Totally going to just, yeah, try it. <laughs> Do it um, okay. So, I mean, I think that that's a really great way to think about traffic. Um, what are you seeing working today in terms of off Amazon traffic? So some of my favorite sources of off Amazon traffic are, of course, Google ads to Amazon because it's just, you know, so stupid cheap and it just converts like crazy um, mm -hmm. and it ranks you on Amazon like crazy. But what are some of your favorite techniques for driving traffic to your brand off of Amazon and on Amazon? Uh for off Amazon, it really depends. Like you have to know what your customer is doing. So like Google is a middle of funnel um, sales channel, uh, paid ads channel. So like if they're, if your customer knows that a product like yours exists and they're actively searching for it, Google is perfect. There is nothing else I would suggest. If someone doesn't, if you're basically providing a solution to a problem that maybe someone doesn't even know exists, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, TikTok, right? Like now you want to go to your top of funnel social channels where you can showcase your product a little bit more, or maybe your product is searchable. However, it's incredibly visual 
and you need to show the differences and not just hope that someone's going to click a search ad or something like that. Because if you're driving traffic to Amazon, you can't do shopping ads. So there's no real visual, although they do now have the um, image extensions and stuff like that. But either way, like there's not enough there for you to work with if it's a very visual product. So that's where I would usually suggest doing social. The other side of it is we actually just did this webinar. Let's say this was last week. Uh, we did one on like e-commerce blogs and all the stuff that most people that have these blogs are missing out on. Yes. Keyword research. Yes. Right. Art, uh, you know, linking and all the articles and all that fun stuff. So like the, the basic SEO stuff that everyone and every person who's ever done SEO kind of knows the stuff that most e-commerce sellers miss out on is all the extra bells and whistles you can add to a blog. So sometimes what I've seen a handful of times I've seen some sellers do is they've actually will create, instead of doing a big investment in their website, they'll actually just start their website a little bit and they'll just do the blog and they'll start creating content, start getting ranking in SEO. But then what you want to do is you want to optimize that blog as much as you can. Obviously you want to link to your products. That's very standard, but you can also create you can have your pop-ups that, you know, have a discount that's only exclusive to people that have visited the blogs to go over to Amazon shop there. You have your sidebar, you can go through all that. But some of the stuff that I see people always miss out on is that we create our own display ads and run our own ads on our own blog all the time. So like if a, uh, if a seller is doing, um, uh, some kind of like, all right, we're doing an article about, let's say a water bottle, uh, but they sell a ton of other stuff. We'll have like a clear CTA of like, get this water bottle and they click it. It takes them straight to Amazon. And it's like a picture and it looks like a display ad, but it's their own product. It's a great way to kind of get that organic traffic because blogs are an asset, right? Like yeah. paid ads is fantastic. But the, the day you're like, you know what? I don't want to run paid ads anymore. It, you know, cash flow is just not where I need it to. Your sales die. But if you just constantly invest into SEO, that's an asset and that's there forever as long as you just kind of tweak it every now and then. So having that kind of approach is what I've really started to see work the best just because um, CPCs are going up. It's like what, like 25% year over year or something like that. So like the cost per acquisition is anyone who's got an average price product, which is between like 20 and $30 for their average order value, they're going to get priced out in the next like two or three years. So by not having like a strong content approach and not being so reliant on paid advertising, it's the same concept of you can't be so reliant on Amazon. You have to diversify. You can't be so reliant on Facebook or Google. You have to find a way to diversify and get sales in from other places. And I think that SEO and content creation is starting to really help sellers showcase that they are a thought leader in the space or that they have the knowledge to justify why they're selling their product. I love that idea. One um, hack that I often give people is some of the top search results on Google belong to YouTube. And YouTube would be a great place. What would we do at Amazing at Home every time I create a new YouTube video, I have my team go back through and SEO the heck out of that YouTube video. And then they also make sure that they write a really great blog post about it. They embed the video and um, put it on our website and put all the great tags, not only on YouTube, but also on our blog. So now not only do we get those top hits for YouTube in a Google search, but we also get those driving direct to our um our website as well. And then if you go back through your YouTube analytics and see what your top videos are, your top video views are and stuff, you can often also relate to that and, you know, create a couple of different blog posts from that angle. And now you get even more traffic, you know, people going to that. So I love that. And another hack that I learned from, uh, I think it was Norm Farrar, um, talked about how every time you do a YouTube video or a post like that, you can also publish that to Google My Business, which has a mm -hmm. huge ranking on Google, right? So that search result for that highly ranked YouTube video is now also in the Google Business search results. And then you've got your blog results that you're just basically using that same content, repurposing it multiple times. Um, so, you know, sometimes just picking those pain points and then also doing your research specific to the platform. 
So if you want to rank highly for a blog, do your research for what people are asking questions about, answer those questions in your blogs, right? Use some of those phrases uh, because that's going to help you. Uh, but then also on YouTube, research the titles, make a really great thumbnail, make sure you're using the right tags. I love the tool keywords everywhere because on Google, it shows you, it's just a Google Chrome extension, you guys. I know you know about those Google Chrome extensions for Amazon, but um, Keywords Everywhere is free. And then you can pay like $10 and you get like a million keyword credits, but it follows you across the internet. So if you're on Amazon, if you're on Google, if you're on Pinterest, if you're on YouTube, you can actually see for a top YouTube, if you bring up that video, It'll show you what tags that person used in the video, all of that, so that that way, you know, you could do that. But I love what you said about using your own images, making your own little ads. I'm going to steal that too. So much gold today. I'm totally going to do that. I think that's such a great idea. Uh, you know, I've done pop-ups and stuff, but a lot of people get super annoyed with pop-ups yeah, yeah, and they have these pop-up blockers now. You know, I get annoyed with pop-ups, so I try to be nice about that. But I love just, you could just create your own little image that looks like a little ad and you know, it's a clickable button, super easy to do on a blog post. Um, so I love it. I think it's really, really smart. Um, and you could even do a short YouTube video that leads to a longer blog or, you know, a lot of people that do recipes and stuff, they'll drive traffic, they'll create this short video about the recipe, then they drive traffic to their blog and then they have offers there you could do the same thing. So, you know, if you sell a cocktail set, you can make a really great homemade margarita mess recipe and then drive that to your blog and people are getting downloading the recipe, making it a printable recipe, but right there, you have your little image of your cocktail set um, and, you know, have the little Amazon badge on there and people get all excited like, oh, I need that too. Let me check that out. So love it. So many great hacks today, Andrew. You're just, I'm totally enjoying this. Love every minute of it. Okay. I feel like we've covered a lot in terms of marketing, but I, I feel like I want to get like a little bit more juice out of the lemon because I know you have like so much more in there. <laughs> but um, so tell me what, besides like, I love the organic, but is there anything else on the organic side that folks should be focused on? I love starting your website with a blog. I think that's super smart. Um, what do you think? Okay, fine. Let's do this. What do you think about WordPress versus Shopify? Um, for e-commerce sellers, Shopify. Shopify. Okay. Even for blogs? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Blogs aren't that bad. You can, you can redesign them and get them to function better than the way that, you know, Shopify gives you, there's a bunch of apps too, that you can make it better, but I'm not buying the whole like WordPress has better SEO than Shopify. I, I just don't, it doesn't make sense to me. We have countless sellers that are ranking top pages over WordPress sites all the time. And I'm just like, I just don't believe it. And from a functionality standpoint, like all the extra stuff that you would want to have, like, yeah, but you know what? You can also just develop that stuff into Shopify. It's not that complicated. Okay. So you're a big fan of Shopify. The one thing I don't like about Shopify is that it nick Shopify nickel and dimes you to death. Like by the time you add all the apps and everything else, you mm -hmm. are paying a lot of money for Shopify. Um, so that any, any ways, any hacks you have for us to avoid, you know, your Shopify store costing you, uh, more than your ad spend every month on Amazon. <laughs> I will usually, what I usually, uh, tell most sellers is it's a lot less expensive to find a developer at a, at a, at a bare minimum, just to consult and just ask them and be like, I'd like to add this functionality. What do you think it's going to take? and then ask them about building it out yourself. And I know it's like, okay, that could be really expensive, in which case, all right, don't do it, do the app. But the problem with adding on all of these different apps is obviously the cost, but it slows your site down. So from, even if you're just doing it for blogs, it's slowing the entire site down. So the overall buying experience isn't gonna go as well. The problem with going with WordPress is that all of these plugins aren't uh, controlled by WordPress. So if they have an update and you update a plugin, 
it could break all of your other plugins. And then you got to get a developer to go in there anyway. At least with Shopify, when they do an update or something like that, it's clear, it's concise, nothing breaks. I rarely ever have anything break on a Shopify site. So if you can, if there's some kind of small functionality, you're like, oh, I just want to be able to add in this, then you can usually have that developed in or you can go the app route, but then I usually still have a developer integrate the app and then have them like clean up all of the unnecessary code that some of these apps have, in which case, at least at that point, you're just using the bare minimum of the app. It's not slowing down your site too much. So what you're saying is that there's a way to develop a lot of the functionality that comes from all of these paid nickel and dime apps on Shopify, instead of having to add 20 different apps that are each 10 or $20 a month on top of what you're already paying $50 a month for Shopify, um, you can develop a site that's very functional for you without you having to add all that extra stuff in. And, um, you know, you, you might not have to add on all, and it works that way for WordPress too. So I don't know why I, I would be surprised, you know, WordPress is, yeah. is the same way. Like if you, if you have a developer, you don't necessarily have to add all these plugins, you know, you can make your existing plugins just work better for you. Right. Mm -hmm. So I love that. Great advice. Okay. So as we're coming to the end of the show here, I like to ask, um, we like to ask what is something that you're listening to that you're reading, um, that's keeping you motivated. Oh man. Uh, Let's see. All right. Well, listening to, I'm going to shamelessly plug myself. So we have, we have our own show. We have the e-com show. So we interview e-commerce sellers and it really is like, even though I'm shamelessly plugging it, it's crazy to hear their stories. It's not like a, we just sit there and just ask them like, how'd you get here? You know, uh, what steps did you take? What struggles are you having with now? We've had like probably like six or seven different shark tank people on there. So that's always a fun conversation. And it's always very interesting to hear someone's story and my ending question that I always like to ask is what motivates that entrepreneur themselves? Like, what is it that gets you out of bed that keeps you working on your business? Because everyone's different. Some people are financially driven. Some people really like what it does for their customers. Some people just think it's cool building stuff. Like it, it, there's so many different, I don't even know if I've gotten the same answer. I've always found that very interesting. Um, and then reading, uh, right now I'm reading two different books. Right now I'm, I'm reading The Messy Middle. Um, just, just because I need to right now. And then, uh, I'm also reading Gary V's new book. Um, just because as a marketer, I feel like I have to, or he might come find me. <laughs> <laughs> Be afraid. Be very afraid. Read it or else. He's I love it. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Okay. So the Ecom show is your podcast and you know, I, I think it's okay to shamelessly plug yourself because, Honestly, I know Andy and I, since we started this podcast, I think we're on like episode 150 something now. We're almost at 160 episodes. We might even be there already. Who knows? But the, the point is, I learned so much. Like just spending this hour from you, with you uh, has been wonderful. I got so many gold Thanks. nuggets. And as an entrepreneur, you know, I don't always take the time to listen to podcasts. And, you know, I, I'm always reading books. But it's these conversations that we have with other sellers, that we have with other business owners. When I go to events, you know, and it 10 X is my business every time, because it's just like these little nuggets that you learn in the conversations and the networking and, you know, the people that you meet. And so having your own show, it really, it really does make a huge difference because you meet so many people and you learn so many things. And then, you know, your networking is kind of also enhanced because you go to events and stuff and people are like, oh yeah, I was on your show or I listened to your show all the time and I learned this and it really changed, you know, my business or changed this for me. So I 100% get it. Um, it's, it's more than just a shameless plug. It, it actually is. <laughs> believable because it's, yeah. it's a huge impact. So very cool. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about your company and, you know, what specifically, you know, you do and how people can contact you. Yeah. Uh, Blue Tusker, no E in Tusker. So B-L-U-T-U-S-K-R. Um, you can go to our website, bluetusker.com. We're on all of our, uh, every social channel. It's the same username. Uh, we're a full service digital marketing company for e-commerce sellers, so we essentially act as an outsourced marketing department for most of the sellers we work with. Um, 
strictly e-commerce uh, tend to focus on sellers that are on multiple marketplaces or the, obviously their own website um, or at least someone that's trying to get there. Uh, and then, um, yeah, or you can also email me, andrew at bluetusker.com. Email, I don't care. I'll answer any question you got. That's why I'm here. <laughs> awesome. So blue, like the color blue and T-U-S-K-R.com. And then what about that podcast that you mentioned, um, the Ecom Show? How do people listen to that? Ecomshow.com where, uh, we got all the, all of the stuff's on there. So you can go to ecomshow.com. It's also on the blue Tusker website. Uh, and we're on, we also film it. So it's on our YouTube channel, but we are on, I think every podcast platform I can think of. So whichever one you like, I diversified. <laughs> well, I would expect that from a marketing yeah, company. You've got to. <laughs> We're going to hold you accountable for that. Well, that's <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew, for being here with us today. Uh, I learned so much. And um, thank you for giving all the gold that you gave away to our audience today. Um, I'm definitely going to try some of it. And I'm going to reach out. And I'm going to join your Slack, too. You have a Slack just for e-com sellers. I saw that. Yeah. So, so then there's sellersslack.com. Um, <laughs> so that is so basically what we did. So actually, so this came out of just like necessity. I was in uh, multiple uh, like Shopify groups, some of the Shopify plus ones, even though they're gated and all that fun stuff. And then I was in a couple other Slack groups and they're all like littered with vendors and it's just mostly people just chatting. So, and, it, and it's just people plugging their own stuff. Like I made an app, I did this, I did that. And it got really annoying. So what I did is like, okay, I'm going to create a Slack group that is gated. So you have to apply to get in. You have to prove that you're an e-commerce seller. And then we allow you in. You're on it. We're on a two-strike policy. And Blue Tusker does not post in there at all unless it is something that happened that we did not publish. So if Shopify did something or Amazon did something like, hey, we found this. This is cool. We really just do it for our own market research. We sit there, see what people are talking about. And then we go, oh, we should write a blog about that. That's, uh, that is the reason that we have. Everyone goes, why do you have this? We go, really just because I need blog ideas. And then outside of that, it's just only e-commerce sellers. There's even like private channels in there for seven figure, eight figure sellers, Shopify plus sellers so that they can, they like to hide in their own corner and just talk to each other. So we let them do that. Um, but yeah, it's awesome. I love it. Very cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little picky about my Facebook group too, because yeah. um, it's so many of the Facebook groups, you know, there's 50,000 people in there, but it's a lot of like VAs and I don't have any problem mm. with VAs, but the problem is where can sellers talk then, you know, yeah. because otherwise, like you said, it's just people just pitching their services, you know, mm -hmm. and it just becomes like, okay, I'm not actually getting the advice that I need. So, you know, we do the same thing. Like if you're, pitching your services or, you know, just giving purely bad advice that shows you have no experience as a seller, like you're gone. Bye-bye. <laughs> so I love it. Very good. Uh, I think, um, Stephen Black calls it the band hammer. <laughs> He's like, you get the band hammer. You're gone. All right. Awesome. Andrew, thank you so much again for being here. And thank you everyone for listening to this episode of the seller Roundtable. Don't forget to rate, review, subscribe, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye. See ya.